Hi class, welcome back to our continuation of lec on the lectures on quantum field theory and this is now chapter 6 on Dirac field equations and this is part 1 of the, of the chapter. So along with this lecture, kindly read um, Quantum Field Theory by Michio Kako, Quantum Field Theory by Manda Unshaw, and Relativistic Quantum Mechanics and Field Theory by F. Gross. To begin with, um, uh, this chapter is about another field equation that is um, the next one that was to that was derived after Klein-Gordon equation. So physicists attempted to arrive at a relativistic wave equation that puts time and space on an equal footing. So in this case, um, since in the Schrodinger equation, you have a second order uh, spatial derivatives there and a first order in time. And in Klein-Gordon equation, you have both the time and space are, are um, second order derivatives. And the Clyde Gordon was the result uh, of that um, substitution, I mean, that attempt to um, put uh, time and space on equal footing by uh, second order special derivatives. And the Klein-Gordon equation was the result, but this led to several problems as far as quantum theory is concerned because probability density can be negative and which is very, which is very unimaginable in quantum mechanics. So there's another one who derived the Dirac field equation. It was Dirac. And um, he um, only considered uh, first order derivatives with respect to space and time. By the way, the Dirac field equation applies to, to spin uh, one half fields, and the associated particle of these fields are called the fermions. And um, yeah, DFE was. A result of putting time and space on equal ground in the equation by considering first order special derivatives rather than increasing the order of the time derivatives. So uh, we'll now discuss uh, the approach to arriving at the, the Dirac, at the Dirac equation. So the approach to the problem is with the goal of satisfying special relativity. So time and space appear in the equation in a similar, in a similar fashion. So uh, recall the Schrodinger equation. It is a special equation. And then from Schrodinger equation, we substituted um, the canonical equivalence of energy and momentum to the relativistic energy mass and momentum uh, relationship and then we got the klein gordon equation and um, the this one takes a different approach and considered using first order derivatives for the spatial coordinates while simulta simultaneously keeping the derivatives with respect to time uh, first order as well. And the main reason for doing this is to avoid the negative probability distribution that arises from the klein gordon equation, which is, which is due to the fact that the equation contains second order derivatives with respect to time. So let's recall the Schrodinger equation. Which is this one. So here's first derivative in time and second derivative in space. And you can actually write this as using the Hamiltonian operator. 
edge so that you have this you can write that as uh, I mean the Schrodinger equation can be written like that The form of the Hamiltonian is chosen so that the requirements of special relativity is satisfied as it is satisfied in the klein gordon equation. So assuming that the, special, that the particle has a rest mass m, the form of the Hamiltonian operator used in the Dirac equation is, in, uh, is this one. Now let's leave uh, alpha and beta for a moment. Now using that equation uh, given in 6.3 and putting it into 6.2, we will get this relativistic covariant equation. Here, time and space have been put on the same footing since they both appear in the equation in terms of the first order derivatives. Now, going back to alpha and beta here, um, these are actually uh, four by four matrices. So, if you would recall, um, in Cartesian coordinates, you have um, your your del operator looks like that, and generally, if you have uh, other coordinate system, you can write your del as like that. You're now taking arbitrary directions E1 hat, E2 hat, and E3 hat. So, you can write your alpha. Uh, by the way, this is supposed to be bold, uh, bold face, but anyway, uh, alpha there is a vector, and you can write alpha as that one. Now let's define the gamma matrices or the Dirac matrices in terms of alpha and beta. And so your gamma, gamma zero is just your beta. This is equation 6.5. And your gamma i is just uh, beta times alpha i. And there are three alphas, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3. Uh, by the way, matrices do not necessarily commute. It, it is not uh, necessarily true that when you multiply two matrices, uh, in order and in in reverse may not be equal but the uh, rock matrices obey an important anti-commutation rule the anti-commutator of two matrices a and b is this one so uh, open open bracket a b close bracket this is just equal to a b plus b a the relationship for the Dirac matrices actually connects them to space space time metric perhaps also a connection to quantum gravity this relationship is given by uh, 
this one here so anyway the anti-commutator is actually equal to the space-time metric here but this one is is a question mark using the Dirac matrices the Dirac field equation can be written using relativistic notation and this is in this form and if you use natural units and noting that your partial derivative with respect to x mu is just equal to partial uh, partial differential mu we can rewrite the Dirac equation in compact form and this is just equation 6.10 <clears throat> This equation actually applies to uh, the field whose quanta are spin one half particles, and that is electrons. And we will find it. We will find this out uh, later in the discussion. But before that, we'll uh, discuss example six point one. Show that the Dirac field also satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. We know that the Klein-Gordon equation is just the Einstein's relation between energy, mass, and momentum in special relativity. This one here. Uh, just that we, we substituted through, through this one and the momentum uh, by that canonical substitution. So, since this relationship here applies to all uh, particles and fields, therefore, Dirac delta field must also satisfy the Klein Gordon equation. And it turns out that it can be interpreted that, that the Dirac equation is just a square root of the Klein Gordon equation. So, now we can show this by deriving the Klein-Gordon equation directly from the Dirac equation starting with uh, the compact form of the Dirac equation here. So we multiply both sides with I gamma nu, partial nu, and the left side gives you this and of course the right side will just be equal to zero so from the Dirac equation itself you have this one is it uh, that's just uh, I mean trans transposing the other term to the right side so we will have um, this relationship also by the way uh, when you say mu gamma nu this is just equal to that expression with uh, um, with the index of the first um, lowered and the index of the the, the next one um, I mean transported up we you just multiply you just multiply two metrics it comes out the same so we have this one
so and this one looks like this and by the way this is also equal to gamma nu partial nu so this one is just this term here so we can we can actually arrive at this one so we now apply the anti-accumulation relation obeyed by the Dirac matrices and this one here so we just have to tweak the first term this one So you can actually write this one as, or, or this one if you want to um, put the index up, then you just have to multiply with the metric here. And so, you will have uh, this form here applying as uh, the symmetric form of of uh, the gamma uh, product the gamma product of the two matrices so <clears throat> this one you will have uh, you can actually write this as write that as uh, this relationship and um, the product of two metric is just equal to uh, Kronecker Delta so you can put the Kronecker Delta in front of uh, here in front of maybe in front of this term I mean and that will give you this and the whole thing would just be the Klein Gordon equation so we can derive the Klein Gordon equation from the Dirac equation. This just shows that the Dirac fields and its particles associated with also satisfy the Klein Gordon equation and hence satisfy the relativistic relation between energy, mass, and momentum. So, the Dirac equation is a relativistic equation as well. So let's now investigate the Dirac matrices. So again, from from the beginning, we said that these matrices are four by four matrices. The first four by four Dirac matrix is the gamma zero, and we define this matrix as this one here where the identity matrix is of course just the two by two um, matrix with one in the in the diagonal I mean uh, yeah we define the diagonal to be this And the rest is uh, the rest of the terms are zero. So, by the way, if you notice here, uh, this is a four by four matrix, and you can actually write this as one zero, and 
this is uh, negative one negative one zero zero so everything else is zero and the trace is trace of the matrix gamma zero is equal to zero that means it's uh, traceless Since the four, the the direct matrices are four by four matrices, the direct field uh, psi must also be a four component vector, so that um, the matrix can act on them. So the vector is called a spinner. So you have this. Uh, as your field and by the way the other drug matrices are written in terms of the Pauli matrices um, earlier on found in quantum mechanics we actually have derived this from quantum mechanics if you could just review your quantum mechanics very quickly and uh, the Dirac Pauli representation would be this one here and your gamma 1 is just equal to 0 sigma 1 negative sigma 0 your gamma 2 is just 0 sigma 2 negative sigma 2 zero and your gamma three is zero sigma three negative sigma three is zero so if you would write down gamma one this is just equal to uh, this matrix So this is the Dirac, uh, these are the Dirac matrices in the chiral representation. Gamma zero is equal to zero identity matrix, identity matrix zero, well gamma i is equal to zero, sigma i, negative sigma zero. Now, what are the properties of this matrix regardless of the representation used whether it's chiral uh, representation or the, the other one um, the matrices or Dirac matrices satisfy this, uh, several properties or relations important to uh, doing the calculation so First, um, we can define another matrix called gamma 5. And this is just the product of gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3 multiplied by i. So that's your gamma 5. And this gamma 5 is a Hermitian. This means that the adjoint the, the transpose complex conjugate is just equal to itself and the square is just the identity matrix and in the chiral representation this is your gamma 5 there's also a Dirac representation where your gamma 5 is uh, written uh, or defined by this one, this matrix so also by the way your gamma mu, um, gamma mu for any mu is just also equal to the identity hence um, 
your gamma mu gamma mu of course you can enter i mean you can put the the indices down and up or up and down it gives you 4i and this is by the way when you have repeated indices i mean your repeated index you have to sum by einstein's notation so here you have um, this and also you have this um, property by the way we don't explicitly uh, show this but uh, it's important that individually you could show this by even by making a counter example so by the way this is just a quick um, proof and um, yeah you can select a gamma and show that these are uh, I mean that the, the gamma satisfies the relation examples example number 6.2 find the anti-commutator of gamma 5 gamma 0 so we know that the anti-commutator of gamma i or any gamma with zero with gamma zero is equal to zero and so applying this repeatedly gives you um, so for example you have you have this and um, the first term here will just be this one so the anti-commutator will just be 0 for gamma 3 gamma 0 then it will just you you just have to interchange this uh, you can interchange gamma 3 and gamma 0 with a negative sign And, and for the second term here you can just uh, interchange gamma 0 and i i is just negative square root of negative 1 so you can just transfer the gamma so you have this and then here you have if you interchange this one into into this one your negative sign here is lost so it becomes positive so um, going on with this similar process you'll be able to find that this is just actually equal to the same terms only negative i mean opposite signed and you get zero now let's uh, look at example 6.3 looking for the trace of gamma 5 so again the product of gamma to itself is just an identity matrix and of course the anti-commutator of um, gamma 5 and 0 is just equal to 0 so let's look at this the trace of gamma 5 is equal to the identity uh, times gamma 5 well if you multiply identity to any matrix it gives you the same matrix but then gamma 0 0 which is just equal to i uh, times gamma 5 and 
is equal to this and when you interchange this one it gives you a negative sign here so recall the trace operation is cyclic so you have this relationship and also you can pull right outside the trace uh, constant so you can just pull out the negative sign so you will have uh, the negative sign here and then this is just uh, equal to that and the only way that you can um, give an equality between the trace of gamma 5 and negative trace of gamma 5 is when the trace of gamma 5 is equal to 0 so therefore your trace is equal to 0 trace of gamma 5 Now let's look at the adjoint spinners and their transformation properties. The adjoint spinner is not just this one, but you write the, sp the adjoint spinner of the f direct field psi to be this, with a bar above the field and defined by psi adjoint gamma zero. So we can write the Dirac equations on the fields psi and negative, I mean psi and psi bar. So together with the Dirac matrices we can form vectors tensors and pseudo, pseudo vectors and others uh, from the Dirac fields and its adjoint so for example psi bar psi or psi times psi bar is just equal to the is, is just uh, what we call a Lorentz scalar and if you have this one this is a pseudo scalar of that form So if you have this form, it's a four vector. By the way, another scalar that can be constructed is in this form here. So since psi bar psi is a scalar and the mass m is a scalar, then the two can be used to write down the Lagrangian that can be used to derive the Dirac equation using the usual methods. So, your Lagrangian is actually this one. Both terms there are Lagrangian. I mean, of this Lagrangian is our scalars. So you can uh, derive the Dirac equation by uh, getting the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to um, psi bar. And of course, you can also get the equation of motion of the antiparticles if you. Uh, vary the the Lagrangian with respect to uh, psi the antiparticles of the Dirac field before we proceed with the solutions to the Dirac equation we first um, know about this 
slash notation. So in quantum field theory, um, it, uh, shorter notation developed by Feynman called uh, slash notation. And it actually simplifies your um, equation, which are, if you have long equations, then you can uh, simplify them. Slash notation indicate a contraction between a four vector and a gamma matrix. So if you have a mu as a as a four vector, then you can write the a slash as this one. By the way, this is uh, beautifully demonstrated in Mathematica using Feynman calc. Pain calc, I mean, in Mathematica, you can write their um, equations. You can code equations there, quantum field equations, interactions of particles as well, and solve for the amplitude. So for momentum, you will have the slash notation written as this one in equation 6.30 so you can write your p slash this is just equal to gamma 0 The whole thing will just give you this one. Where the PO there is just equal to the energy. So in the next part of the lecture, we will get into the solutions of the Dirac equation. And so this is the part one of our lecture and hopefully you have learned something about the other relativistic uh, field equation called the Dirac field equation or Dirac equation.